central passage of scripture. You know, we're talking about laying up treasure in heaven, but when will those things be examined? Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about that today. So I want you to have your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. So 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. We're really going to break down a passage today. And um, let's get going. All right, my friends. Well, I remember when I was in college, I took college algebra. Now, I'm not good at math at all. I mean, I went to college on a theater scholarship, so numbers and me, well, we've never really been good friends, okay? I unashamedly will pull out my cell phone to add the most simple numbers. I never really got the seven, eight times tables. I didn't. Um, percentages, fractions, and just please no, forget the metric system, okay? I never got any of that. Matter of fact, to this day, my seventh grader checks my fifth grader's math because it's already gone beyond me. And don't even get me started on Common Core. So it's just poof, okay? I'm terrible at math. I'll just own that. And so when I went to college, I will tell you that before I took college algebra, they put me in pre-algebra because I couldn't even have passed college algebra. I had to take another course that didn't even count for any type of grade. I just had to pay, take it, pass it, so that I could pass college algebra and actually graduate from college. So I did pass that class. I went on to college algebra. And let me tell you something. That class owned me. <laughs> it owned me. Before each test, I would drop everything because I knew if I was gonna graduate from college, I was gonna to have to pass this class. Every assignment, I went to the tutorial and I did it in the tutorial. Every time there was a test, I cleared my schedule so I could just totally focus on college algebra and trying to wrap my brain around those crazy numbers. You know, there's something about an examination that pushes us to prepare. Exams are not something our teachers concocted for us to make us miserable. They spurred us on. The test spurs us on to achieve our potential. Knowing an exam is coming has a way of inspiring people to prepare. Do you know that I actually not only passed college algebra, but I made a B for a girl that made straight 70s in high school just to pass just to pass for me to make a B in college algebra was a huge thing. Did you know that potential was even in me? No, but there's something about a test that causes us to prepare. Do you know that there is another examination coming? Throughout scripture, we are told of the examination that God will give. It's called the day or the judgment seat of Christ. And in this examination, God will not use a scantron or a red pen. He will examine our works with fire. And God, like any good teacher, has told us of this day, not to put us under the pile, but so that we will prepare and achieve our full potential in him. He wants us to do well. He wants us to approach the judgment seat of Christ with confidence. Today, we're going to unpack one of the central passages about the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to learn what we can do to fireproof our treasures. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that this talk today puts no one under a cloud of guilt, but it inspires us to achieve our full potential in you. So Father, I pray for a paradigm shift within every woman on this call and every person that listens to this video afterwards, that you would help us, Lord, focus on how to prepare for the day that we meet you face to face. All right, you guys, let's start with what the Bible has to say about this topic. First Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. Paul is speaking. He wrote a letter to the people in Corinth. So it's called Corinthians. He said, chapter 3, verse 10 of first Corinthians, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder and someone else is building on it, but each one should be careful how he builds for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. 
If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Okay, we got to break this down a little bit. So verses 10 through 11 was the, by grace, I given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. Now somebody else is building upon it. Let me, let me explain that Christ is the foundation. Christ is the foundation of the church. Christ is the foundation of our lives. When Paul said he laid the foundation in Corinth, he meant he founded the church there. He went there, he preached Jesus Christ, that he lived, died, raised from the dead. He preached his resurrection. People placed their faith in Christ. They began to meet in homes together. They grew in their relationship with God. That message continued to spread and on it is to us today. So Christ is the foundation of the church. So, so that's what Paul means when he says, I laid a foundation. Paul's not the foundation. He preached Christ crucified. That's the foundation. And when he went there and he preached, like I mentioned, people put their faith in Christ. But Jesus Christ is our foundation personally. Now, when I was in college ministry, I met a young woman named Reza. And I met her at the University of Houston. I used to drive from Katy to the University of Houston at least once a week. Uh, let me tell you something. I don't miss that. I miss the students that I met when I was in college ministry. I do not miss having to find a parking spot at the University of Houston. It was horrible. I would drive around the parking lots and I had my sufficient tags, you know, that I needed, but you still can't find a parking spot. And uh, I would look for a student and I would say to them, um, hi there, are you uh, about to go to your car? Like I'm some stalker. And they'd be like, yes. And I'm like, can I just follow you to your car? <laughs> because I need your parking spot. Oh, it's horrible. But anyway, um, I digress. So I met a young woman named Reza and she told me that she had been, she had an uh, Indian background. She told me she'd been sneaking off to church with friends for several years. And she had questions about Jesus and about Christianity. She talked to me in their student union building about, you know, she didn't understand, you know, she's hearing God and then she's hearing, you know, some of these pastors talk about Jesus, like, are they the same person? It's very, very basic questions about Christianity. And I was able to explain to her from scripture that, yes, they are the same. She asked, who is the Holy Spirit then? And I said, well, the Holy Spirit is God as well. We talked at length. At one point, I told her that Hinduism could never be her foundation because believing in many gods, believing in reincarnation, no matter how sincerely she believed in those things was not a solid foundation upon which to build her life. That only Jesus Christ would fill the God-shaped void in our lives. And after reason I talked for three hours, she bowed her head and placed her faith in Christ. Now, let me tell you something. Many people had already helped, you know, lay that foundation of Reza's understanding about Jesus Christ. I just happened to be the final link in the chain of which I was excited to be. But there were people that had brought her to church, that had given her Bible that she kept hidden in her room. She had been to church services and things like that. She had gained some understanding and was questioning and seeking. And I was excited um, to have that conversation with her. So Christ has to be our personal foundation. And like a home, we will build upon that foundation, right? If you got a foundation, you're going to build something on it. So uh, our passage says in verses 12 through 13, says, if any man builds upon this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hair, straw, his work will be shown for what it is. The day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. So gold, silver, costly stones, well, those are just symbols of things that lead to pleasing Christ, of building his church, his kingdom on earth. Uh, things such as sound doctrine. That's what I teach you guys each week. Sound doctrine is the, the things that I'm saying from my mouth 
are coming from the Bible, not some Facebook meme I saw that sounded good, but wasn't rooted in anything, not just some idea that, you know, some people think may help them like, um, I don't know, feng shui, these ideas out there. No, sound doctrine is teaching that's from scripture. So those things are things to use to build upon your foundation. Um, other things would be pure motives, things done for Christ, not to gain man's applause or not to have a selfish gain. Those are things that would be like caught uh, gold, silver, costly stones. These are the things to build upon your faith in Christ. Gospel centered activity sharing the gospel message. Each of you have a God story now. It should contain a little capsule of the good news within it. Every opportunity you have to share that, whether the person trusts Christ with you at that moment or doesn't, is something you are building unto God's kingdom. You're building upon your foundation in Christ. Now, wood, hay, and stubble are things that don't last for eternity. Uh, these can be popular ideas that aren't rooted in scripture, uh, many people have the good person religion going on. Matter of fact, I would say most of America has a good person religion. If you're just a good person, you know, you just sincerely believe in something. And if you're just a good person and we've, I've, I've just beat that down that, that you can't, you can't be good enough to reach perfection. Heaven is holy and perfect. No matter how good we try to be, we're still tainted with sin. We still need Jesus's substitutionary death on our behalf. We can't be good enough. Matter of fact, it's always a sliding scale. You compare me with Alejandra, and I don't look as great because she can speak in two languages and she can share the gospel with two whole people groups. Okay, so maybe I don't make it in, but she does. She's really extra good. But you know, you compare me with somebody that you know murders somebody or cheats on his wife. Well, then I look pretty good, right? So it, it all depends on who you're comparing yourself to. It's all relative. It doesn't work. The whole system breaks down. That would be wood, hay, and straw. Okay, or just using your money for temporal purposes only. Part of your finances needs to be going to support the local church, foreign missionaries, people that are entering into different systems that need help. We have to use our finances for those types of things. We need to use our time, not just for ourselves, not just in the gym, doing combat, uh, lifting weights. Our time has to be used for godly things. So when it's not, it's temporal or just living a self-centered Christ uh, instead of a Christ-centered life. Now, I want to tell you something, and I'm going to touch on this later. All of us have wood, hay, and straw. All of us <laughs> have it, okay? So let's just clear the air right there. None of us is perfect. None of us is perfectly using our money or perfectly using our time or perfectly using our talents unto the Lord. So, so just understand that we all have both. But now that we understand that one's going to last for eternity and one's going to get burned up in the fire, it at least helps make us aware. Now, the day, I want you to circle that in your in scripture, okay? Because the day, that's in verse 13, highlight it, circle it. Notice the day is capitalized. This is a big deal. This is a momentous day. It needs to be on our calendar our eternal calendar. It's already on the calendar, whether you want to face it or not, it's happening. The day refers to the day when every believer will stand before God and give an account of the stewardship of his or her life at Christ's judgment seat. Many Christians have not heard or have not taken seriously the judgment day of Christ. They're unaware of this upcoming fire Understand that the judgment seat of Christ is only for believers. Believers will be rewarded at the judgment day. Okay. But unbelievers are not here because if your foundation is not in Christ, if there hasn't been some point in your life that you said as an act of faith, I put my faith in Jesus Christ, you're not even there. You've already been separated. The goats from the lambs, you're already gone. Okay. So we need to understand that it's just for believers because if you don't have a foundation in Christ, you're not even there. You, did, you had nothing to build upon. You have nothing to reward. You never even placed your faith in Christ. You're not at the judgment seat. You were dealt with at the great white throne judgment. I don't have time to get into that one today. All right. And it doesn't even really go along with this eternal laying up treasure in heaven mindset. 
but maybe in the future. Okay, the good news is, is that um, the purpose of the judgment seat is not to punish our sin. That was already punished, already punished on the cross. Our sin has already been dealt with once and for all on the cross. So instead, God is looking for things to reward. He's looking for that gold, silver, costly stone, those things that were done for him, for his kingdom while on earth. Now, 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul addresses this again in another letter he writes to the uh, Corinthians. So I'll read that verse. 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul again hits on it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what's due him for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. So the good and the bad, you're going to have the gold, silver, costly stone. You're going to have the wood, hay, and the stubble. One's going to be rewarded. One's going to be completely burned up. And our works will be tested with fire. Okay, so circle that in your passage. The day will bring it to light. How? Fire, fire will test the quality of each person's work. Fire is used throughout scripture as a purifying agent or a consuming force. Now, when I picture my works being tested with fire, I picture all of my wood, hay, stubble, all of my gold, silver, costly stones literally being lit on fire. And in one instant, it will purify it. It'll consume anything that wasn't eternal. Some believers will be left with nothing but a dark hole in the ground. Oh, they'll still be with Christ, but they'll have nothing to show for their life on earth. Their foundation is secure. They place their faith in Christ. But they'll have nothing for Christ to reward. You know, it reminds me of my husband. We have some land in LaGrange. And when we bought the land, it had tons of dead trees on it, dead things everywhere. He's literally spent like five to seven years. Like I remember when we bought it, he spent years digging up those old dead trees. Some of them are already fallen down anyway, making these humongous burn piles and then burning them. And it's crazy how much time it takes for him to literally drag everything into one spot. He'll take a picture of it for me. And within hours, it's all gone. And you know what's left? A black smudge on the earth. Nothing is left. One thing I want you to understand, like I said, is that we're all going to have that wood, hay, and straw. Our motives for doing things are not always pure. We do not always make the right Christ-centered decisions. But what we don't want to have is only ashes left. We don't want to be staring into a black hole magnify that black hole by a million fold and you get a sense of what's awaiting many Christians at the judgment seat of Christ. So much of what we're going to do is going to be burned up. We don't always yield to the Holy Spirit, but no matter who you are, we all have that wood, hay, and straw, but we can make a concerted effort to make sure that we don't only have ashes left. But before I get there, let's look at this. Verses 14 and 15 says, if what he has built survives, he will receive a reward. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> if it is burned up, he suffers loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through flames. Well, what is our reward? You're like, bring it on. What shall I look forward to? Well, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, no, I has seen no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. How God will, will reward us that day is incomprehensible to our finite, limited minds. But the rewards are worth it, or else why would God had so strongly urged us to prepare for them? We get a glimpse of some of the rewards when we learn about crowns the crown of life, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, the crown of rejoicing are just a few mentioned in scripture. We can be sure that God's rewards should be looked forward to. They're the healthy motivation we actually need to persevere under trial. Then it says if he's burned up, he will suffer loss. Again, we can see that there will be some that are kind of plucked from the fire. 
this person himself, he was saved, but he has nothing to show for his life, nothing for Christ to reward. I mean, who is this guy escaping through the flames? Well, one example of a person like this would be the guy on the cross right next to Jesus. He really didn't have much to show for his life. He was on the cross next to Jesus. Jesus said, tonight you'll be with me in paradise. And they both died. So somebody that puts their faith in Christ last minute, but doesn't really have an opportunity to lay up treasure in heaven would be an example of somebody that's kind of escaping through the flames. They're there, but they have nothing to show for it. Or maybe this person is a Christian who put their faith in Christ at, at some point, their growth was stunted and they just remained a babe in Christ. Okay. There's another passage that talks about babes in Christ that Paul was like, move on, grow up, get mature. Or you're like a little babe in Christ. You're still on milk, move on to the meat. It's a whole nother teaching that I've given in the past, but, but there is people like that, but they'll place their faith in Christ, but they don't grow. Their growth gets stunted. They choose not to pursue the Lord. They're not growing. And um, they have, they're going to have nothing to show for their life on earth. Or this guy, this woman, could be someone who never really let Christ have lordship, the reins of their life. They just wouldn't let God have control. So they were incapable of investing in anything other than wood, hay, and straw. They kept saying to God, you know, I got this. I know this. I'm not going to step out in faith. Oh, that would take too much bravery. I'm just going to play it safe. I'm going to play it safe. I know you're telling me to invite my neighbor to church, but I'm just not going to do it because they're going to think I'm weird. Next time we both see each other taking out the trash and the recyclables. So I'm just going to play it safe. Keep it at home. Okay. Somebody that doesn't obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit are going to have a hard time laying up anything other than wood, hay, and straw. Or, or this person could be somebody that's done a ton of good works. Maybe this person's even led somebody to Christ, but it was all done with impure motives, more out of performance than out of a love for Christ. Listen, there are people out there that are doing incredible good works, but if their foundation is not in Christ, if it's not unto God's glory, if it's for themselves, for them to build their own kingdom, it's wood, hay, and straw. So the day is coming. Here's three pivotal ways I want you to prepare. Number one, foundation in Christ is your foundation in Christ. This has got to be a settled issue. You can't build upon a foundation that's not there. Has there been a time in your life whereby an act of your will, your faith, you received Christ as Lord and Savior? Don't put this off another second, okay? I know there are some people listening here. There's some people that are going to listen to the video later that they're still wondering, ah, should I cross that line? Should I go all in? Maybe next week, maybe, maybe I'm waiting on an emotional experience or I've got this one more question that needs to be answered. Let me explain to you that, that we'll probably never know it all. But you, if you've been with me, then you know enough to place your faith in Christ. So Number one, to prepare for that day to meet Christ face to face. If you want to even be at this day, then don't put off another second placing your faith in Christ. And matter of fact, I feel so passionate about this that I'm going to give us a time today to place our faith in Christ when I end. Number two, focus. We're always in danger of becoming preoccupied with things that don't matter, with things that are not eternal that are not even the will of God. Make decisions in light of the upcoming fire. Ask yourself what relationships, what activities need to be reprioritized or deleted altogether in light of the day? What dreams or goals need to be brought under the Lordship of Jesus Christ? You may be chasing after a dream, chasing after something that's not what God wants you doing at all. Maybe it is. But whatever it is, place it under the Lordship of Christ. Let me tell you something that I do every day. I wasn't even planning on doing this, but I looked over these cards. I'm going to think it's of the Lord. Every morning, I get on my knees right here by my chair. I feel emotional telling you guys this, and I wasn't even going to go here, but let's just do it. 
I have written on these note cards areas of my life that I want to make sure that the area itself is not becoming an idol. I want to make sure that every area of my life is under the lordship of Jesus Christ because I am I'm prone, I'm human to chase after lesser goals, to chase after earthly things. So each morning I put Lori Joyner Ministries on the altar and I say, Lord, whether this thing becomes a big deal or not, it's your deal. I don't want to chase after things that I don't need to be chasing after. You want me to still do connected? I'll do it. You want me to do a podcast? I'll do it. But if not, I won't. I want your will to be done. I put my family, every, every person, putting them on the altar, especially my husband and my two sons every day. Lord, I don't want my sons to be my idol. My life shall not revolve around my son's happiness. My life will revolve around you. You are the one that I will meet face to face. And so when I'm strict with my boys or they don't understand something or um, mama's preaching too much, I'm like, oh, well, you know what? I, I put them on the altar every morning and I've got to answer for their little lives. And it's not about their happiness. It's about their holiness. Bottom line, I put the gym. Now you guys know how much I love the why, but I tell you what, I don't want the gym or all my classes to become an idol. I say, Lord, as long as you can use me here, then put me there. But I don't want those classes or people saying, oh, you're my favorite instructor. I don't want that to get in the way of eternity. There's too many hours spent at the YMCA for me not to be thinking eternally about that time there. So I put it right on the altar and I say, Lord, it's your will. As long as I can make a difference for you, as long as I can help people there unto you, then keep me there. I put myself on the altar every morning. Lord, I don't know how many days I've got in my bank account. I don't know how many days I'm going to be a sound mind, but whatever it is, let me use them for you. And lastly, I pray for my, our nation every day. I pray that God would help our nation be a godly, righteous nation and shine the light of Christ to the world. We have to be focused. Whatever it takes for you. With me, it was note cards. For you, it may be a verse for each area of your life that you've got taped up in your kitchen, taped up at your, at your you know, mirror, taped up in your car. I don't know. I don't know what it is for you. For me, I opened my desk drawer one day and I was like, I got a whole stack of note cards. <laughs> and this is just what I've been doing. And really, that was kind of a private thing between me and the Lord. But if it helps you, then there you go. <laughs> um, so one, foundation. Two, focus. What needs to be report, reprioritized? Delete it all together in light of the day. Number three, pray. Pray for a long life to lay up much treasure in heaven. For our works to have pure motives that we would see the opportunities around us. We wouldn't be too busy to step out in faith and do what God's calling us to do. So each day I am praying. Make, obviously my foundation is secure. I locked that in at 16 years old on my knees, asking Jesus to come into my life, to forgive me of my sins and to make me the person he meant for me to be. Focus every day, reset those priorities. And number three, we've got to be women of prayer. Let me tell you something. I pray for a long life so that I can lay up as much treasure in heaven as I possibly can. Okay. It's not something I'm trying to do on the down low. Like I'm going to try to sneak it in. <laughs> you know, God's told me to get prepared. So I'm trying to be prepared and prayer is a great way to be doing that. You know, I remember my high school graduation. I graduated in the middle to lower part of my high school class. I wasn't that great in high school. Remember the whole seventies with math thing. And I didn't get saved until I was 16, about to turn 17. I had a crazy couple of party years. Some of you know my testimony. My 10th grade year, I was kicked out of school for five weeks. So my brain was not in gear in high school, okay? And I remember seeing those students walk across the stage and they had like the tassels on, you know, and they, they had been, you know, graduated with all these honors. And I was sitting there in the middle of the class thinking, oh, that's a bummer, <laughs> you know? I mean, I just sat there and looked back and thought, man, coulda, woulda, shoulda. I mean, I, I just didn't have my brain in gear. I thought maybe if I just didn't get kicked out, maybe if I didn't cut up in class so much, 
Maybe if I wouldn't have been so concerned with other people and what we were doing on the weekend and actually applied myself just a little bit better, maybe I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be one of those maybe honor students or something. Maybe I'd just done something differently. Yes, that passed through my brain, uh, every one of those thoughts. But you want to know what the overwhelming feeling was, actually? It was joy. Joy that I was done. I had finally graduated from high school. I could totally leave that chapter behind. The screw ups of that chapter, the bad grades of that chapter, I could move on. It was a celebration that day. My family had a big celebration for me. I'm the oldest of all the grandkids. So it was an incredible day after graduation. Let me tell you something. That's what it's going to be like at the judgment seat for you and me. There will be a moment wishing we'd done something different. But the overwhelming emotion will be joy. Because God is going to reward us. God is going to see those gold, silver, costly stones, and there will be a reward because that's what the judgment seat is about. Rewards. All those hardships endured, you'll be rewarded for. All those tough decisions you made, you will be rewarded for. All those unpopular stands, all those prayers for lost friends, lost family, all those Bible studies you helped lead. You attended, you invited somebody to. All those people you encouraged, wrote notes to. All the times you sang songs to God from your heart when no one was listening. All the times you said in your heart, God, draw me near. All the countless dominoes that all that affected will be rewarded. You will be rewarded. You will get to hear on that day the words of Jesus say, well done, my good and faithful servant. It's going to be rewarded. Those things that nobody sees right now, God will see and reward you for it. So I want to spur you on today to keep at it, to keep on, and to, get, to have an even greater focus from this moment on. Oh my goodness, what an emotional day. I don't know if I'm just emotional because it's the topic or if it's emotional because it's the last day of our Bible study. <laughs> but nonetheless, let me pray. And then um, I'm also gonna give us an opportunity to place our faith in Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want every woman on this call and every person that listens to this video on my YouTube channel, or at home to be prepared to meet you face to face. Father, I pray that this would be the wake up call, the turning point that we really need to get focused, to reprioritize, to look at the schedule and say, I'm spending a lot of time in this and it's wood, hay and stubble. Lord, help us in our hands, release the things that aren't gonna help us for eternity. Help us let it go and help us really focus. Lord, would you rise up within us? Give us the mind of Christ, the eyes of Christ to see, to make decisions that more align with your eternal destiny for our lives. Lord, I pray for anybody that hears this that has never placed their faith in Christ. I don't want them to make an emotional decision. I don't want it to be because Lori cried today. <laughs> I don't want it to be because they're scared. I want it to be because they've been learning about you and they've been learning and you've been drawing them to you and they know in their heart it's time. And so if that's you today, you can pray with me. Just after me in your own heart, Lord Jesus. There are two days that matter. The day I place my faith in you and the day I meet you face to face in heaven. Lord, today is the day that I receive you as my Savior and Lord. Lord, would you forgive me of my sins? 
Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you that you were buried and that you rose from the grave victorious. And that with you in my heart, I will serve a living God. Father, I thank you for eternal life. I thank you that you've come into my life. Lord, I pray that you would make me the kind of woman that you desire me to be. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Friends, if you prayed that prayer today, then you will be there with me at the judgment seat of Christ. You can begin now to build upon your foundation and be ready for that day where you hear Jesus say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thanks for being here.